My name is Chris Thompson. I'm really just the second of like four or five Chris's here at the Portland Timbers and Thorns, so I'm relegated to just being initials at this point, so we avoid any confusion. Um, everyone else that is Chris has been here for like 12 years, so I don't get much of a say. I've only been here for four. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how sports team uses data, go through a few examples of that was made here uh, to help our executives, help our staff understand more about what's going on in the data so they can best evaluate uh, what to do moving forward and design strategy around that. And then we'll go into a few things to build together specifically around how do we use, uh, how do we map out our stadium in Power BI? How do we use scatter plot to really uh, kind of hijack that into using a stadium map? And then also talk a little bit about customer voice and how we can use that to process real-time decisions for our post-match surveys, in-game surveys, and really react in almost real time to fans at our stadium during the uh, So I'm gonna dive right in here to the point. Perfect. So scoring with data. Uh, so how does the sports team use data? Uh, well, you know, every team has a variety of different hardware and software stacks that best fits their needs. Um, today we're going to focus mostly on business use rather than team use. Uh, so the clubs, uh, the athletic side has their own separate instance of data um, that we don't get to really touch. We get to stay all on the business side. Um, sports tends to have a pretty bespoke uh, a model for all their different software that you can't just necessarily plug and play into any old CRM. Um, for instance, SeatGeek ticketing, only a handful of teams around the country would use that. Um, so people don't already have out of the box solutions. So we have to come up with our own solutions to bring that into our data environment. Ski data access control. It's another one we use here for scanning tickets. How does that interact with SeatGeek? How does that interact with our data? And how do we best get real time data out of that? Um, you would most likely see ski data outside of sporting events at parking garages. So if you're at any of the uh, easy parks in downtown Portland, you would notice that those are also ski data access control. Um, so we have some similarity uh others you know tools that we might use is yougov use that for partnerships to analyze all of our sponsorships help determine our fans what their likes and interests are as well as using customer voice as a first party surveying tool for uh, getting real-time data um, all of these combined with dynamics and any sort of email marketing that any teams use and data analysis can create quite the interesting use cases that you might not see outside of the sports industry um, first example that we might have, uh, so we can measure usage of our SeatGeek app and specifically the widgets that we have within the app. We partner with SeatGeek uh, to do all of our ticketing here at Providence Park. Um, it can be a little hard to read from the screen here, but if you notice that there's a lot going on here, we can measure the amount of times people view and click on different parts of our widgets. So when you pull up a SeatGeek app, You'll be able to look at your ticket and then scroll down and see a variety of different options that we've put together. We can put this together day after a match and talk with our marketing team about what works, what doesn't work, and really start to A-B test out different marketing tools for future matches, products, and also help with all the informative parts of our widgets that we put into the app. So we can decide what is the best way to get the most important information in the hands of our fans before they come to the stadium. Talk about digital marketing return on investment. So we do a lot of paid advertisement to bring people to Providence Park uh, and getting those leads into our system for our sales reps to reach out to. Um, this helps our marketing team in real time determine what paid advertising is working the best. We're able to see the conversion rate on particular items. We're here, how many tickets were sold off of a certain campaign and establish the value and also determine the return on investment if that was a successful campaign or not. The more successful we are, the more likely we're able to do it and the more likely we'll get more fans and produce more revenue for the clubs. Um, and it also shows where everything is in the pipeline so we can determine our timing. Uh, we can see where people are in the process, how many are still being used, should we slow down, should we speed up our amount of advertising that we're doing in the paid social space. We can do real-time scanning for our events. Uh, so this one we can see, uh, we can give this to our operations team and 
for this particular event, you're able to see in one screen here the amount of scanning over time and how people are entering the stadium. So that helps us determine post-match what we what is successful and what isn't for any sort of programming before the game. Was there a giveaway? Was there not? Was that successful in bringing more fans earlier to the stadium? Were there peaks where there should have been more staffing? And that's where we can go into the second event here. We can see here that there's also you can scroll around over time. I don't think it's going to let me because I tried embedding it. I'm not going to let me here, but uh, you can see in real time, uh, over time, what gates are going to see spikes in activity. So our operations team can gather the right people to those gates in order to uh, free up any sort of build up in lines. Of course, uh, everything spikes closer to the game, so they start to prepare for that. Uh, more and more over time, and you can see what gates are going to need more help where. And then we can start to drill down, obviously, into the sections that are coming in. Where are club people coming in? Are they coming in post-match from, from gate A, gate B, gate C? And how do we treat those people relative to the east side line and field, goal box, so on and so forth? We can establish certain programming around that and evaluate how different sections of the stadium come into the stadium. Or, how different sections of the stadium enter. We can also do new sales tracking, and you can see here kind of what we're going to start talking about is how to create kind of a map of the stadium and really analyze down to the seat rather than the section uh, what is going on with what you're looking at. You can do a lot of different things with that. Um, here you can see pretty just a nice simple graph showing new memberships sold over time. The graph is able to show out a cone of certainty. Uh, for new projected sales that we can put together with an equation shows our most uh, used or most purchase price levels. So GA, very popular. Um, sideline up on the upper sideline, you can see is also very popular, not only in the stadium, but also in our little graph here when we're breaking it down into larger chunks. Um, yeah, so we're going to jump right in. To Power BI to talk about the scatter plot graphs and how we go about creating that. So I've put together a data set here that we can really dive into. So, first of all, we need to get a map of our stadium. And to do that, I'm going to just show you. I was able to grab a map back in the day from our partners over at SeaGeek that they have online. So it's going to exactly show what fans are seeing that we see. You see here, I just pulled this up quickly. Every seat and location is on here, but we don't know the X and Y coordinates for each one. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we've got a handy dandy website here from our friends at interworks.com that we have worked with way back in the past. And you're able to upload an image and bring in scatter points that you can then put into an Excel file, which you can then put into any place you want. So what we did in this case is we take that file here, put it in, and we can start to plot out our XY coordinates for It would stop that. Come on. There we go. For our scatter plot that we're going to make. So if I wanted to, and this took a, an intern quite a long time to make for us uh, back when we first made it in 2019. But as you go along and click, you're able to get all of the XY coordinates showing up on the right here that you can then bring into an Excel spreadsheet. I've got an example here. I want to bring in all of the Section 118 row A seats here. So let's just say I grab these four, copy them to the clipboard, paste it in, and then I can do a quick and now I have my point X and point Y for this section. And what you would do then is then attach this to the data that you have stored wherever you might have it. We have this stored in a 
a data warehouse that we then upload and then build onto the table where the seats are stored. So now that we have that data brought in to our database, we would have it brought into Power BI through, normally this would be brought in through SQL, uh, just for this instance, we're bringing it in through, uh, this is just a spreadsheet that I put together that would simulate what you would have brought in. Um, so first thing we wanna do is select our scatter chart. Now it's just a plain old scatter chart to start, but we're gonna bring in our seat center X and our seat center Y. Of course, it just tells us that it's the sum of those numbers. What we want to do is already change this to average. And then we want to have a legend. And we're going to pick for this instance, actually, we want our values. Um, and we're going to put on markers here. We want a color. We're going to change this to. Let's say we want to look at the clearing price of our secondary market. And we want it from red to timbers green. Sorry about this, where did that go? Well, while that's, while I figure out that part, we're gonna actually bring in our plot background area first. And if I go back to that, grab that image we brought in earlier. Yeah. Gonna bring that in. Now it doesn't fit in here, so we have to change our X and Y axis maximums. And you would do it to the maximums of the image that you have. Oh, I know why I picked the wrong. This is what I needed. Can't seem to get it to work here. One second. Jeremy pinged, uh, do you need to change the resolution of the canvas? And no worries, I don't think a single user group goes by without the, <laughs> what, what do we call it, the dreaded? Um, if you demo live, it's never gonna go 100% right, 100% of the time. <laughs> we'll be able to fix it here. Perfect. There we go. Beautiful. Ah, I just needed to not summarize. That was my problem, of course. I was picking the wrong thing. I went to the, I did this earlier and I don't know why I didn't think of that. Um, anyways, so you can see here that we've brought in 
all of the seat locations that we have for this. And then we're just going to bring in a quick slicer to go through all of the different events that we have in here. So we're able to see here, this is an event we had in 2022 against the Philadelphia Union here. And what we're summarizing here are all of these events. Let's just say call these the, um, this looks like just, if you scroll over, you can see the first name of the purchaser, and then you can also see the amount of revenue paid for that. These are all just random names, random prices, not anything you would see. And then we can also fill in an equation here. If we go into our visual and to our markers and go to color. I cleared that and then I can make this to whatever I want. So if I wanted to do, let's just say I want the clearing price like we were doing earlier for our sections. And again, we're going to do red to green. And this is the clearing price of secondary market tickets. So tickets that people have purchased and are reselling. We're able to get a good view here of where are the ranges of pricing for seats. Now, the, the one thing about Power BI can be hard to read a little bit. So if I want to zoom in using a zoom slider, that won't necessarily work here. If you use a zoom slider, you have to then put in the X and Y axis. And the problem is, is that it doesn't necessarily stretch with the image. So we do have to stick with this. But we're able to see, get a general grasp of some seats are selling better than others based on our gradient that we put together here. If we want an even better, we can add a middle color. So if I go back into markers, go back into color, I can add a middle color, make that timbers gold, and we can see even better where some of those stand out. So we can see that most of this is kind of the orange, everything, you know, this was a random prices on average, but we can see a few green ones here. This was overpriced probably for this particular section here. And then we can see most of these are all within the right price. Perhaps we want to do something. We want to evaluate uh, renewals. So if I want to go to people who bought season tickets for the 2022 season, I'll have all of these season tickets here. And then I can go into the legend for our graph here and I want to look at renewal status so I can understand what sections are still up for renewal, what sections are confirmed for the next year and what sections have seen a lot of drops. So here if I just bring this all the way out as much as I can. You can see that this section is doing quite well for renewal so you see a lot of blues in here for confirmed for next year. This one Perhaps this section has something wrong with it here and that we need to address uh, going forward or as they're all still reserved and still awaiting decision for the next year. So perhaps we need to do some targeted emailing for this section. We can see over here that this has the same issue. It's kind of 50-50. Some sections might have a lot more canceled. So if I wanted to look at people that did cancel, instead of looking at renewal status, I'll move that into a filter for us for this page and look at people that dropped. And then I'll want to look at the drop reason in our legend. So now we can see all of the drop reasons, perhaps why people are moving out. We can see that these sections are here. Most people are dropping because of price. These ones, not a lot of people are dropping, so that's a good sign. Here, this one too, a lot of people are choosing price for a reason. So maybe we overpriced during our renewal season and we need to reevaluate going in the next year. This one, this one stands out because it's mostly experience. So what about the section is causing a larger than other amount of sections for experience uh, as the reason for dropping their season tickets for next year? Maybe this section needs new programming that we need to come up with, or is it just upgrading that section with better seats, or do we need to do something entirely different and just remove the section? Um, does it make sense to have something this far in the corner of the stadium? Um, are we able to remove it? Are we able to turn it into just single game tickets? Maybe it's a group section that we turn it into. 
Um, either way, these kind of visualizations help our staff to develop a strategy going into next year based off of what's going on this year and be able to pick out different patterns for us pretty quickly. So that's what you need to do for an XY scatter plot graph. Uh, once you get all of those 20,000 plus XYs all plotted out, that's probably your hardest part. It's pretty tedious for the most part if you don't have it. Um, but once you have it, it can make a very cool and an inviting tool for you to utilize. Uh, I think I'll just answer any questions that might pop up here for this portion uh, of our presentation. I mean, I just have to come off and say, I think this is so neat. I'm a huge believer in um, visual representations of our data and just making it very accessible and easy for uh, anyone, the average Joe, to understand and be intuitive about their data. So I, I just think this is super neat. All right. Uh, I'm going to move into the next part of this and utilizing Microsoft's customer voice and Power BI to make some real time decisions. So what we have here uh, at the club is we have post match surveys that go out after every match. Uh, we'll focus on a Timbers one here. So the first part is setting up obviously your survey and what you want to do to capture out of it. So obviously we want to capture uh, all of the experience. Uh, and how people feel about coming to our events and then be able to quickly turn around and make changes for the next event uh, that we might have coming up. Those events can be as quick as a three day turnaround. For example, we have a game on Saturday, Sunday, everyone's off. So Monday we start receiving all those in all those in and then we have already until Tuesday night to make changes for the Wednesday game in terms of experience. So we have a quick turnaround because we have two games in four days. Um, we're going to look at Perhaps this one you would set up, you know, we keep all of our questions the same for the big things we want to control and focus on, you know, your match experience at Providence Park and that, you know, we're asking how did, you know, how did you experience the match? Tell us one through 10 and how you can improve that match, your, how we can improve it in the next time, you know, pretty basic stuff that you would have in a post match, in the post survey about any sort of product, um, asking them about how they feel about stadium policies, how do they feel about concessions if they purchased any? And then we have logic applied to gather those answers depending on their answer. If they answer you know, a certain amount, we have logic brought in here in customer voice to show that you know, if it's an eight or less, we want to see how we can improve it in the future. Generally speaking, we're aiming for an 8.5 or higher for a really good experience. If we're below eight, we feel that there's a lot of room for improvement in our stadium. Most of that's because people generally have a high affinity for sports teams so that we feel that we're already getting a big boost out of that. So we need to really go above and beyond to provide a really good experience. So when somebody fills this all out, this all goes into the dataverse, which is really helpful. And why I really like customer voice is that it's really accessible. So I've brought up right here our post-match survey output essentially already done for us in Power BI. Um, and you can see here we're able to create a lot of different visuals over time. How have we done in certain sections, the match scores for each of our sections, and then our analysts dig into the comments afterwards to really pull out and pull at threads as to where those pain points might be for lower than average scores. And obviously here we have two teams, so we do look at both the Timbers and Thorns and we're able to select back and forth. And our uh, our executives at a higher level will be able to uh, easily get to a match they want to look more at. On the back side, in Power Query, we'll go through the steps in order to bring this to life because it's not as simple as just pulling in one table. You do have to bring in a couple tables and merge them together. Um, again, the nice thing is that you can bring it all in through Dataverse. So I'm going to open up a new file here. And we can walk through a few of the first steps that we would need to do for it.
So I want to connect to the dataverse where all of this lives. And the nice thing about also having in the dataverse, we're able to connect it to our dynamics eventually as well. So all customer voice data lives in a, a few, has a specific prefix. So MSFT. So it comes from the, or sorry, MSFT. Uh, so it all comes in from the same area as forms, uh, but customer voice also lives in here. To pull out everything we need, we need MSFP project. Essentially, this table brings in the segments between timbers and thorns. Because if you look at our projects, we have all of our post match surveys living in two spots, and this essentially gives us the distinction between the two clubs so that we're able to easily sort between the two. You'll also need to bring in MSFP question. This is all the different questions that you might have in a survey. You need to bring in MSFP question response, the responses to your questions. And then you need to bring in MSFP survey. So all of the specific surveys. We're going to want to transform this data. And for ease, I'm just going to import just so we're not waiting on any changes that I make in direct query. But if you want live data, direct query is going to be your best route. All right, so we need to actually bring everything else into for our ease into MSFP. Just trying to move this out of the way. It doesn't want to move for me. We want to bring everything into MSFP questions. So we actually have to start joining tables together. So what we'll do is go into our merge queries. And the first one we're going to want to bring in is MSFP question. One second here. Just pulling up my notes so I don't have to wait so long like last time. So we want to bring on question response ID onto question ID. There are so many columns in here. Microsoft does not make it easy for you to bring these all together. Here it is, question ID onto your question ID here. That way we're getting all of the actual questions in text format to our responses. We can just expand this table to bring in the actual name of the question. And you could bring in other types. Perhaps it's a choice type you want to bring in to understand more. Perhaps there are other properties you want to know about. You want to know, was the response required? You want the question text, perhaps the question type. You want to know the survey name that it came from. We're just going to hit OK and expand that table out. Because this all lives in the dataverse, the nice thing is you don't need to go in and start reconnecting all the data models to that together. Microsoft does that for you because it's all in their common data model. Now we have all the questions for our answers. We have so many columns to get rid of by the time we're done with this. 
There's our question names. And then our responses would be right here. And then we're going to merge one, two more onto here. Yep. Need to bring in our survey. Sorry, our project. Expand this one more time. I believe we need to bring in one. Here it is, survey. So we can bring our project onto the query. Perfect. Now we can bring our project on so that way we can distinguish between the two clubs. So this is our last query. We want survey on to project. There we do need a survey in here so that way we can get the project ID. This is why we're using import and not direct query for this. And we bring in project. And this will finally bring us to the last distinction we need to make in order to efficiently determine every different match from each other and determine each club from each other. So here's our last merge then. And we would just expand that to bring in project name. You can bring in anything else that you would want as well, but for our case today, we just want the name. Perfect. So now we have all of the different project names 22 from last year. We'd have 23 in here. You can filter down to all the different projects and then filter down to all the surveys you want. And then you can start to get rid of all the columns that you don't need. We're not going to go through all that because just because there's so many. You can see here all of the different things that we've had to do in our power query. You know, the nice thing is just picking remove columns or choose columns helps kind of get rid of that part of it. But then we go through replacing any errors, any values that we want to replace. And then we're able to start building out our visualizations. These are all pretty simple. Um, this one, you know, this is our surveying score over time. We're able to see, hey, we started to improve as the season goes on for our concessions experience. And then things started to dip down. Why was that? Go into our survey, start to pick out what concession stands were having the most issues. Was it evaluation? Was it a operations issue? Um, perhaps we were running out of food at certain stands. You know, that has happened from time to time. You can see here we had two matches against Mexican teams, and you see that there's four surveys instead of two over those two matches. As we created, um, customer voice does have the ability to 
go back and forth between English and Spanish. Um, but it's kind of not that obvious. So we wanted to create a secondary survey that people had to take that was solely in Spanish without having to swap back and forth. Um, a lot of these people were new fans as they are fans of our opponent. And you can see that we were doing really well with those fans that came their first time in Providence Park. So we can evaluate perhaps new fans have a lower expectation. How do we really step up our game for those that have been here longer and that are longtime fans? Same thing with likelihood to recommend. That's our NPS score for the most part. This one is just a standard easy to use one. You can see over time how it fluctuates up and down, but it's right in that eight to nine range where we want to be. Same thing for match experience. This one obviously swings a bit more with the match outcome. Um, we do A-B testing on how far out we should survey people, how close to matches we should survey people, um, and do some A-B testing based on the result of the match. This one will fluctuate roughly. I think we see about a 0.5 to 0.7 swing, depending on how well the team performs on the field, is what we found over time. So you can see there are games where we do well when we're winning. There are games where we're not doing as well when we're losing. Um, some fans complain about the refereeing in this particular section, uh, which can pull out. So a lot of things that we do need to continue to hone in on to make it more scientific, but it's a good barometer of how we're doing. And then up top here, you can see that you know, we can see all the different match scores for each match. Quickly dive into those. And then we can go into different things based off of one time things that we do. Perhaps we asked if for a few matches, how did people use a secondary uh, website that we have? This one in particular was for Kansas City so that we didn't ask that question. But later on, we do ask that question at the Seattle match. We ask them, were you aware of this? How did you use it? And we're able to then dictate the different strategies around how do we make that more visible? How do people use it? What do we need to really highlight within that portion of this secondary website? Chris, I Jeremy, have a question. go for it. Do you guys wait to send the surveys out after a loss? Uh, no, we don't wait. Uh, we don't wait that long. Uh, it's generally the same time we found that uh, after A-B testing, um, it doesn't really affect whether it was a good or bad score. If it's a loss, it still shows up no matter how far out you do it. Uh, and in fact, generally what you see is probably um, inflated scores. Uh, for concessions, because if there's a bad concessions experience, we want to know about it and wow. delaying that, um, you know, it starts to lose. You want to get that particular bad event into the survey so we can correct those issues moving forward. Um, so that even though that maybe there's essentially a negligible amount in the match experience, getting that concessions uh, experience scores more important so we can address the issues that may be there because it's more fresh in their minds. The longer you wait, the more likely they're to rate it better than it probably was. So a lot of this analysis is using um, the quantitative numbers, right? Are you doing anything with like the verbatim text or any comments field to tailor what level levers you pull after seeing scores? Yeah, so the uh, qualitative research is done by one of our analysts here. Um, she goes and digs in after every match. We did attempt to use Power BI before ChatGPT and their their purchase of that uh, was using Azure Learning Services to really evaluate the comments. And we did that for the 2022 season. Unfortunately, it would apply the number, the, a quantitative number to the um, the word is off. I can't think of it off the top of my head. It's uh, essentially how the person feels based on what they put in. Analysis. The sentiment analysis. Yeah. So um, we did try that for the 2022 season, but two things kind of became obvious. Uh, one, a lot of people tend to get sassy, and the language model didn't necessarily pick up on that and would rate perhaps a bad comment good or a good comment bad. Um, so we didn't feel that at that time um, the Azure natural language services necessarily understood what was coming through. Um, 
And I'm not saying that our fans are sassy. I just think humans in general, when they're having a bad experience, might be a little sassy. Um, so uh, it, it was just hard to pick that up. And we didn't feel that it was providing a good qualitative uh, analysis of what was happening behind the scenes. So having an analysis re- or analyst to dig in uh, to what people were putting in with each poor experience or good experience helped us really determine the levers that we dictated. Uh, in 2022, we also asked questions around COVID-19 and vaccinations. Uh, we would have obviously very vocal fans that wanted vaccines and very vocal fans that didn't want vaccine requirements. Um, but based on our surveying, it really helped dictate that when we put a vaccine requirement in place and how long we held on to that for. Um, it was a very big part in determining our COVID policy from 21 to 22. Cool. This is cool stuff. Thanks for explaining that. No problem. Tim, uh, word clouds. Uh, yes, we tried that as well in 22. Um, again, it it wasn't very good at the time. By the time that chat GPT came out this year uh, and really turning Power BI into Fabric, we're kind of behind the ball right now in developing it for this year. Uh, this offseason, we're really going to start leaning into that more, starting to hopefully see what can Fabric do to really start to make that natural language processing come out in Power BI and Power F- or in the Fabric environment. Um, again, the word cloud just pulled out words that didn't make sense. It would pull out too many unnecessary words. Uh, a lot of people, when they have a bad experience, will write a very long response, and a lot of that will have a lot of unnecessary words that won't necessarily equate to what we're looking for. Awesome. Well, with that, I would love to encourage people to come off camera, uh, come off mute. Let's give CT a round of applause. Thank you so much for coming out and presenting to us nice virtually uh, tonight. Yeah, very cool content. This is great. I, yeah, okay. I love the visual. I think that is so neat. And can you share a link to um, the the site that you use for the template for um, porting over the different um, axes? Sure can. I'll put in chat right here. Uh, Don't uh, hate on them too much. They do say it's for Tableau, but obviously it's (laughs) very easy for us to all use in Power BI. So uh, it's a very uh, all-inclusive tool, and it was very helpful. Um, My poor intern that you're going through 20,000 data points, (laughs) but uh, they've made quite the impact on the organization for us to be able to really set that up and put things in motion. And that sounds like a perfect intern project. Well, I don't want to spoil it, but we did. I did have someone back channel me, and they were like, "Did we just discover the Bob Ross of Power BI?" <laughs> so I'm going to throw that kind. out there. <laughs> uh, some of the other cool things with the customer voice that we're working on with our our partners over at SkyPoint, uh, we're mm-hmm. going to start porting in some of that data directly into our customer profile so we can have our service reps and our sales reps when they reach out to people for servicing season ticket members, they can understand right then and there, hey, this person had a great experience last time they're out or this person has had consistently poor experiences. What can we do to make them feel special? And if our sales team is reaching out, they're able to understand right then and there in front of them, hey, this person had a great time, really start to have a conversation about what made that time so special for them at Providence Park and how they can take advantage through season ticket membership or bringing out a group of friends um, and really start to make it a more personal connection when they're on the phone right away. Awesome. I had a question. So we're using customer voice and BI as well. And um, what's your, out of all the question options that you get in uh, customer voice, what's your least favorite to analyze in Power BI? Oh, I think it's the Likert scale. I think I'm saying that right. Yeah, Yeah. they do not make it easy for you to seamlessly bring in. So we try to avoid that where we can. Um, Maybe we just kind of make a so Likert scale, where it's just a bunch of ratings for us in one page. Um, or if we do use a Likert scale, we kind of bring that data in more manually. But those, generally speaking, we're not doing for live quick reaction. That's the nice thing about uh, the post-match survey. We're not looking for those Likert scales here because we're trying to find quick uh, solutions for our upcoming matches. But we do use them for bigger surveys. 
Yeah, they they are definitely a pain to analyze, but the usability they like because on the mobile you just use your thumb <laughs> to drag and drop. Thanks. So, what were the data sources you had now? Yeah, so it's all different sort of data sources. Um, you know, the ones that we use today, uh, obviously, customer voice uh, was the serving. Uh, data source that we would use that we email out to fans after every match for the XY scatter plot that would actually come to us from our ticketing partner SeatGeek. Um, so we would connect to them through either data warehouse that it was flowing into, um, which is what we traditionally used to do, but we're also uh, uh, trying to build out a new solution to their new API that they released. So we're working on that as well. So that all comes right from our ticketing provider. Sources, correct? I'm sorry. Just two, and just two and data sources, correct? Oh, for these particular ones, uh, if I had to name all the different data sources off the top of my head, it's probably like nine, ten, twelve, thirteen different data sources that we use. Um, you know, we have YouGov, we have Ski Data Access Control, uh, things that I talked about early in the presentation. We also have, um, you know, we get info from uh, Zoom. Uh, Zoom info. Uh, we have data sources from uh, all of our social media metrics that we can use to manage our partnerships. We have Apple TV data because MLS is on uh, Apple TV. So if you ever want to watch Lionel Messi, he's in MLS now. So subscribe to MLS Season Pass. I'll plug that real quick. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a lot of different data sources that we have to fold in. And one of our things that we're hoping to transition to is really use one lake and really bring that all into fabric here. Hi, I'd like to know what kind of nuances or challenges um, did you have working with your data in Power BI that you were not expecting? But... Um, well, Mark already brought up the one. Uh, Likert scales are extremely hard to do in Power BI, uh, or at least the way that customer voice presents it. Um, the XY scatter plot was probably the one of the first solutions I found very hard was probably one of the first things I had trouble trying to figure out how do we bring in a whole stadium and then start to map out and really show in the visual all the different things going on. Um, ticketing providers aren't necessarily, they don't necessarily care about, um, you know, how the data gets to you. They just provide it and Ticketmaster has been around for 30 years or something like that at this point. Um, for a while, it's their API is very archaic, so it is hard to work with. SeatGeek has also been hard to work with initially, but as time has gone on, they've all developed to have more understandable APIs and really bring things to where they need to be. Uh, I found that the sports sphere tends to lag behind. You know, not everybody is an Amazon, Google, Microsoft company. Um, so they tend to lag behind and things tend to be really monopolized. So innovation in the data space can be slow at times. Um, so I think just working with older technologies in Power BI can be challenging, but we've found very creative solutions over time. And I think everyone is starting to catch up to where uh, all of our data visualizations and all the different data flows are, are going to be. Tim asked, have we ever tried to track customer spend in the stadium? Uh, we have tried. Uh, we did implement a new POS for our concessions, uh, and we do have access to our merchandise. So we're actually starting to figure that out. Um, it's hard because not everybody is giving you their name or their email and everything they do. Uh, perhaps we build out an app and incentivize people using that to check out where we can track their purchases. I know a lot of teams do that. Half the reason you get an app for a club is so that they can track all of your spend within the stadium. So that's really just a data, that's a data ploy for them rather than a, a benefit for you. Um, so we're starting to really get down that track, trying to understand the spend of all of our fans across the stadium and what is going to work and what won't work going forward. So we're in the starting stages of really getting into that uh, now that we've got new software that can help here. Uh, a power app app. Um, I, I 
perhaps in the future, um, but I don't think it would work well with our ticketing data right now. Um, I think our ticketing provider needs to catch up. We have to get all sorts of iframes from them and really get them to coordinate uh, as part of a reason to really use Power App, um, which I don't think they're going to necessarily like. Seeky likes to have people stay within their app, which uh, we've really enjoyed their app. It's actually really customer friendly. Um, it's really easy to access your tickets, and all of our fans really like the Seeky app. All of our surveying and their surveying shows that fans are big fans of just going into SeatGeek. They can do two clicks. And they've either transferred their ticket, resold their ticket, or they've purchased another ticket. So it's a really great app, and there hasn't been really necessarily a need for us to move to a new app at this time. Um, you mentioned integrating with Dynamics with your Dataverse. Uh, so you know, with your with the fans, and I'm one of them, but um, how how do you have that integrated with Dynamics? Is it just by cell number or an email as a contact record? Uh, and then if that's the case, how do you deal with dupl duplicates? Yeah, so we're working through that as well. Um, you know, we're working with a company called Engage RM. They're based out of Australia. Um, most clubs and most teams um, usually go to a third party to help integrate their ticketing data to get the APIs into a place for them to process and bring it into a, an easy to use view. Not a single CRM is made for sports and ticketing, so all of the nomenclature is just kind of uh, not made for it. So they help bring that into that space and really revolve around the uniqueness of season tickets and the renewal process. How do you bulk move those down leads? Um, and then also, with the you know single game tickets or partnerships and all that, they really help in that process. Uh, to your other point about email, so they use uh, email, the ticketing ID that's generated um, and phone number. Um, and then they have different rules going down from there. Uh, and But we do have, you know, a, not a super clean database when I came in and we've, we're still dealing with the effects of that over time. Um, I would say that you know, email is our primary source. Part of that is because in our email marketing, uh, email is also our main the key there. Um, and then that's kind of been the source of truth for, you know, identifying what people are active or not. And then we're able to merge that information from the most active profile into the right one. Uh, but it's a work in progress. Um, and I would say email is probably the, just because of the way it's used in ticketing, and especially since our ticket provider doesn't allow duplicate emails, so it's easy for us to uh, use that as well as kind of, hey, this email, this address, this phone number, these are all the correct information. Link that to the right profile and dynamics and then merge down from there. So that's kind of where we're using the source of truth to really figure out what particular duplicate email we had is the correct one. Hope that answered your question. I feel like I went in a circle. Thing. No, I, I when we market and uh, you know, in, in when customer voice is tied to a contact record, it's great. Uh, but then enter in, uh, we've got that customer in there three times, you know, with different email addresses and um, finding those folks um, is fun. Yeah, the nice thing is, is we do only send our surveys out to people who scanned in. So that helps also narrow down like this email was the most active one and we're able to tie it to the correct mm. contact record. Oh, that's cool. Thanks. So again, thank you, Chris, so much uh, for braving our humble user group and presenting to our team here. No problem. Thank you for having me. It was great to to present to a wonderful user group and, uh, you know, want to shout out SkyPoint Cloud. We're a great partner of theirs. Um, and we love uh, working with them on a daily basis. So I need to put that out there too.